moving right along. So it's always a pleasant challenge to think about uh, what the keynote should be for the keynote talk, that is, for, uh, for Bob. And uh, what I often do is I go to the big research conference on functional programming and look for talks or people that I enjoy listening to. And this year, the opening talk of ICFP was one where I immediately thought we've got to have this at Bob because it brings together all the things I think that, that make Bob different from other conferences, really thinking about what the best tool for something is. So uh, I present to you Leif Anderson. She's a PhD student of uh, Matthias Felleisen. Matthias Felleisen heads the group that develops the racket system, which hopefully you will have heard about. If not, you'll hear about it now. Leif, take it away. Warm okay. round of applause for you. <laughs> Accessibility. Uh, most of the prominent code will be this size. There will be a bunch of code that is smaller. If you can't read that, please feel free to move up. There's plenty of space. And finally, if you are colorblind and can't actually see the difference between these three colors, uh, let me know. I've tried to make sure everyone can see, but uh, but I'm not perfect. Uh, also, I'm very, very, uh, I myself am pretty blind, so if any of you have questions, uh, rather than raising your hand and I won't, won't notice, please just shout out the question. And with that, this is me. Very, very poorly drawn me. I like playing with shiny toys. Specifically, I like recording things. This is great, except when I get encrypted to record a conference. In this case, I was asked to be the AV chair for a racket con back in 2015. And the recordings, they all went great. But at the end of the day, I had to find some way to bring all of the pieces of these recordings together. I had to merge the presentation screen, the picture of the presenter, and the higher quality sound, and somehow mix them all together into a video like this. Well, you know, the first thing I did was I opened up, this is called a nonlinear video editor or NLVE, it's what professionals use. And I sat down and, you know, after some time I was done <laughs> with one video. <coughs> Unfortunately, this is a conference, so I still had a bunch more to do. So I could either just, you know, do the same thing again, or what really I needed to find a better approach. I needed to find some way of to automate this job. So I went and looked at the landscape. I, I, I thought to myself, you know, professionals do this, there's got to be a way. And I, I found three sort of classes of tools. Either you could write a plugin for a nonlinear video editor, you could write a uh, sort of UI automation tool like an operating system level macro, or you could use shell scripts. Needless to say, I was progressively less and less happy with what I looked at. So I was just thinking, you know, we, we have a problem. Shell scripts are great, except I spend all my time dealing with writing a shell script and not enough time actually editing the video. What I really wanted to do is have a language where I could edit videos and only have the language sort of get in the way when I wanted it to. In other words, I wanted a DSL. They are the ultimate abstraction. <laughs> because I work on Racket, I had a great tool for making domain-specific languages. And what I want to do right now is share with you what I was able to, uh, I able to come up with. First of all, you start with a, a library. And then on top of this library, you can sort of wrap around the linguistic features. But uh, first, let's, let's go over sort of the library and what, what the features are that you're going to, to want. In the case of video editing, I was able to split it up into sort of four different categories. The first is producers. These are anything that are used to actually you know, produce your, your video. They are the, the primitives. Specifically, 
a producer is anything that works with this render function to actually give you your video output. The most easy one to think about is clip. Clip just takes in a file from your file system and makes a producer from it. So of course if you compose the two of them together you get an actual video. Filters, they're like producers uh, in that they, op they operate on a single producer but they, they, they take in a producer and uh, give you a slightly modified version. So in this case we have a video of a, a bunny waking up and if we were to pass it in through this sepia filter then we get the same video except all sepia colored. Next, playlists. Playlists are the easiest way to compose producers together uh, temporally, one after another after another. And so in this case we have the bunny jumping and then we have a squirrel flying. Sometimes though you don't want to just jump from one clip to another, so you also have transitions and we can put the transition right in the middle of these two producers to cause a sort of fading effect from one to the other. <coughs> Finally, just as produ or playlists compose uh, producers temporally, multitracks compose them spatially. So you have one on top of the other, and you use a merge to determine how you want to, to put these producers together, the most one be common one being some sort of composite. And so now we have the bunny and the squirrel side by side. All right, so these are our primitives that the language will use. But now we need to actually take a look at what the language itself will look like. Like, like what do you want a language for editing videos to, to be? So uh, this, this is what it looks like. Uh, you have some common things. We have the primitives we've seen, but you also have things like list comprehensions. And because sometimes you, you know, the whole point of this is to make your whole uh, video editing procedure automated. We have, you know, modules. And inside of these modules, you're going to have functions to call. And in this case, we have a sort of video that, uh, or a function that takes in a video and puts a logo at the beginning of that video. <coughs> Finally, you'll notice that there's a hashling video at the top and a hashling video lib at the bottom, okay? This is just to indicate that the library file is defining this branded function, whereas the hashling video file is, is an actual description of the video. So if we were to go play this video then, you're going to get something like this. Okay? You start with the video, get the brand, uh, the logo, then you get all the uh, videos sort of laid out together because of these four horizontal and four vertical. <coughs> so we can stop this video and start it again. But this is just one expression. The language semantics we want to compose lots of different videos together, uh, one after the other. So we could even do something like, say, clip dragon.mp4. And when we go and play it, now we have a clip of a dragon before our branded video. Now, you'll, you'll notice that I'm typing in this, this vid right there. Um, that vid is sort of this data structure that represents the results of the video file, okay? So, I was able to then go use this language to edit videos, and interestingly enough, the time it took me to make this language and edit videos with this language, uh, it, it was actually less time than it took to edit these videos manually the previous year. So I saved so much time that this, this DSL paid for itself with one use. This is a, 
a, a big concept that I want to get across <coughs> that like DSL should be so easy to make that you know you might make a language and then only go use that language in one program. So how do we make these? We, we need to, you know, if we want them to be easy to make, then we need to you know, figure out how to do that. And the tool we like to use, we call linguistic inheritance, okay? So uh, imagine you have sort of this base bracket language on top of that, you have a implementation of your video language, and then up in the clouds you have this sort of uh, actual movie script. So when you go and you, yeah, pardon me, when you make new languages, the first most obvious thing is you'll go and inherit from the bracket VM. You'll maybe remove linguistic constructs. You might add some of your own. And what's really interesting, and you don't really see this too often, is you might actually change the meaning of existing constructs. Let's take a look at this. Uh, so far, we've looked at four, um, four horizontal and four vertical. Here's another case where we want to make a, a new language feature for playlists. And this will just take uh, all of the videos in this source, um, the scene list, and go and replay them one after another. Uh, effectively um, making a playlist. So how are we going to go about doing this? First off, we could, we could think of making a function, OK? This for playlist function uh, is going to take in the sequence of videos and another function that you use to, to to make this list and you, you define the body as just you know you, you take your playlist and your, your, your sorry your playlist function and you apply it to a list uh, a lot of people when they think of domain specific languages they'll they'll play with this and it's okay but the problem is when you use it you end up having to sort of make this not entirely nice looking thing where you have an actual list and an actual function and you know you're able to run it and it it works but it looks kind of ugly so there's got to be a better approach uh, the next obvious thing we could try is a macro uh, in this case we just expand to uh, applying the playlist to an actual list and, you know, this is great because we can use the syntax that we had previously wanted to use. Um, and we're able to get the, the playlist constructor. Unfortunately, this doesn't work if someone has decided to rebind playlist to, say, 42. In that case, you're going to try to apply the number 42 to a list, and that just does not make any sense whatsoever. All right, so uh, the, the yeah, so so macros and functions both don't really work. What we really want is a sort of small language to help us write these syntax transformers, if you will to make your, um, to, to actually make all of the bindings in your language be bound to the lexical location of the, uh, of the definition rather than its use case. So in Racket, we have this uh, thing we call define syntax rule. It's very similar to define macro, except it actually it actually binds all free variables to their location in the macro definition. <coughs> we can run this, and even though in this example we bound playlist to 42, we're still able to actually use this for playlist macro. 
take a look at how this works. Um, in the first file, we're going to have our four playlist definition, and in the second, we'll have a use case of it. When the file expands, uh, because this four playlist right here was defined in the first file, it is actually able to distinguish between these two different uses of playlist. Cool. That is great, except for playlist is sort of a local language feature. But as, as I said, sometimes, you know, when making a DSL, you want features to be non-local. In specific, in the case of video, you want to collect all the expressions into a sort of playlist that you then provide. To do this, we have these things we call interposition points. The first and easiest one is app. This is just inserted any time you have a function application. But the really interesting one is module begin. You see, when you have a file in any sort of language on top of the Racket platform, it gets read, and this module begin here is inserted based on the language of that file. Then this module begin will elaborate to a <coughs> predefined module begin that we have, you know, used in, or declared in red and, you know, handle all the uh, video specific transformations. That way you only have to handle video and you let your, your host language handle the rest. <coughs> the way you do this is you are able to define your module begin with your own name, and then you provide it with the module begin, uh, the, the module begin name here in yellow. And so, just like with four playlists, you're uh, able to distinguish between the two module begins. This, this pattern is actually so common that <coughs> It, it's used, it's defined in the standard library for Racket. It's defined in this make wrapping module begin. How, how is that done? Well, the, the, the key here is, is this defined syntax. You see, in Racket, we have compile time code mixed in, in line with runtime code, and this, this allows you to both put sort of your language definition and pieces of your language in the same file. However, when, when you think about it, the language that you want to write your compile time code, it's sort of the same language you want to use to write your runtime code. So the client syntax acts as a bridge between your compile time and runtime code, uh, where the main identifier is bound at runtime, but this expression is evaluated at compile time. That way, when you define your file, instead of just exporting function, you're actually exporting languages bound up in a library. This makes them very easy to both write and distribute. All right? In fact, so easy that video is actually several of them. You see, when you're making a language, you, you want this whole ecosystem of parts around it. You're going to want your FFI if you're using it. You're going to want documentation. And while not strictly necessary, it would be kind of cool if we could come up with a type system. So let's just start with this FFI thing right here. Uh, to make more sense of this, we need to look at the video pipeline. Uh, what you see is you, you originally have video source code. It gets sort of compiled into this internal data structure, which again gets further compiled into this FFmpeg data structure, which then is handed off to the video runtime, which is a sort of Frankenstein of FFmpeg co code and video code, if you will. The end result being your outputted video. So, as before, we have a problem. You know, 
we want to solve this problem in its own, own domain, and so let's make a DSL to do that. First, let's let's take a look at you know what what a C function is going to look like. You know, you have you have your name AV frame, frame <coughs> pardon me AV frame get buffer and takes in some arguments. So what we would like is we have a DSL <coughs> called you know FFI that allows us to simply write out the name, write out the parameters it took, the value it returns, and and even do error checking. In fact, uh, so this FFI we did not create. Uh, it, it actually was created several years ago. But it actually turns out it's really good, so good, I in fact prefer to program in C programs in it rather than C. So I get all the error checking taken care of for me instead of having to, to do it all manually. But on top of this existing FFI, we wanted a video specific FFI. You see, FFmpeg uh, has some structures similar to the one I talked about earlier, except we wanted to sort of reify them into the language. So, what we, we rather than programming everything directly in FFmpeg, we created this intermediate layer to create all these primitives. So that gives us part of our you know, infrastructure, but we also want documentation. So like before, we have a documentation problem. Like before, we want to solve it in its own domain. And so, again, like before, let's make a DSL. Now, so far the code I've showed you has all been very s expression -y. That kind of sucks for writing documentation. Like, really. So instead, what we want is we want to write a language that allows us to create uh, documentation, you know, that is prose based. And it turns out there's lots of languages that do this. In this case, we made Scribble, where it, this is actually running, like, this is basically running on the rack of VM. So, but, but, but it's prose. So this goes to show you that, you know, the, the Lisp idea of creating DSLs, while it's good, people frequently claim, you know, you, you have to stick with S expressions. This is, this is patently not true. In our case, we made something that looked like literate programming. Uh, in fact, this is, um, it, this becomes so easy, we didn't, write video directly in this language called Scribble. As you see here, we wrote it in this specific documentation language we built on top of the Racket documentation language. And why we want to use this over using HTML or LaTeX uh, directly is you get all of this tooling support. Do uh, Dr. Racket is a IDE that you can use to make videos. Now, now, now anyway, and you get all of the function calls, uh, definitions, uh, basically all of the, the good support you want for an IDE. So, finally, while strictly not not strictly necessary, we have types. What would a type for a video be, though? Let, let, let's take a look at this one video here. We have a, a video clip. It's 50 seconds long. Let's put it, take out the first 100 seconds of that video, right? Does that make sense to everyone? It doesn't to me, because what is the first 100 seconds of a 50 second clip? Is it the clip twice? Is it the clip going to a black screen? Is it just a second fault? So, clearly, delete your hard drive. I propose we have a type system that just bans this. In particular, we have a type. Videos are length. Uh, and so videos of a shorter length are super types of videos of longer length. This means that you can plug in, you know, if you have an infinitely length video, 
you can effectively put it anywhere a video is expected, but if you have a super short video, you can't put it where it needs a long one. Right. How do we write a type system? Well, frequently it's sort of built with this recursive apply uh, pattern matching loop, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> right? As, as I've said before, well, you, you all know it by now, I want a DSL to do this for me. So, if I were a type theorist, I would go write out all the rules in some <coughs> math like this. And it would make perfect sense in this case if they put function and just said, look at the length of the file in your hard drive and give it that type. It'd be great if, you know, it could look like this. Uh, thanks to um, Turnstyle, which is a DSL for creating type systems, we were actually able to create a type variant of video on top of it and video. In fact, we did this in a few hours just because we could. Uh, there was just a test to see, see if this was possible. It turns out it is. So that's great. Making DSLs is easy, but it could be better. Right? We have a DSL problem. We have to make DSLs. You all, by now, you, you can repeat it to me. How, how do we solve this? Right? Exactly. So what we are going to do is we're going to introduce syntax parse. A DSL for making DSLs. All right. So before we use this thing called syntax rule, we made this playlist operator. And you know, as we showed you earlier, this works out great. Uh, in this case, we're going to define a function called define playlist, just takes in some uh, producers and puts them together in a playlist. So we're going to define this playlist called double, takes in a producer, returns it twice, and you know, this works. We can pass it in a producer. And, and we get a playlist. Unfortunately, we run into problems if someone sort of mixes up the language and tries to call it with A, B, and C in a list. Which, to be fair to someone who would do this, this doesn't, while it's technically not valid in Racket, you know, other languages, rightfully so, use syntax similar to this. And uh, unfortunately, you get this error. But the error says lambda, not an identifier. You know, what is this? Now, we can look at the implementation here, and we can see that there's a lambda, but, and, and that's fine for a small language, but what if your DSL is several hundred or several thousand lines long? You don't want to expect your users to have to know what the implementation of your DSL is. So syntax parse comes to our rescue here. Here we're using define simple macro, which is provided to us by the syntax parse DSL. And all we have to do is now label our function name saying it's a function header. Everything else remains the same. We're able to say that you, know, you take the name of the header and the args of the header. And now, when the user makes an error, you get a much much cleaner error saying, you know, define playlist, it didn't expect this syntax. There's, you know, your developers can now just go use the documentation to fix, <coughs> fix their problem. All right, this gives us our tower, or at least most of it. I seem to have forgotten to draw the top bit. It's all black. Well, I've talked about how great using a textual DSL is for editing videos, and I stand by this. But, but sometimes you really do want to edit videos graphically. Sometimes you want to be able to say, you know, I have this clip here and this clip here, and I want to 
drag this clip here and maybe resize it, eh, not move it. I, I, can, I can do this, resize it, and then, you know, play it. Of course, I also want to use my textual DSL. So I want to actually put my graphics right in the, the, the textual representation. And you'll notice, if you look at this playlist right here, that's actually video code in my graphical editor, in my video code. You can also put a graphical editor in your video code, in your graphical editor, in your video code. You can go all the way down uh, until the end of the world or you run out of pixels. Probably the pixels will come first, probably after three layers, but you know, if you have a really good monitor. <laughs> so this is great. This is actually working code. Um, <clears throat> I was able to, you know, edit actual conference videos with this function. Except we can do better. <laughs> I talked about this language-oriented programming thing and how great it is, you know, to not just have a length DSL DSL. What if we had an editor editor? Okay? Now, to be fair, a lot of this is still future work and still kind of, um, you know, under development. But just as we have with, you know, define syntax and begin for syntax, which are primitives we can use to sort of connect compile time DSL creation with runtime DSL usage, what if we had begin for editor and define editor? And what if, what if these things were so powerful, we could actually just use them in the same file? If we could say, you know, I want to write a program in my editor language, uh, I want to create a video editor, and then later on in the file, use it. So I have, you know, you know, I'm able to do all the moving stuff and whatnot. And just like with the DSLs we talked about, I am able to change the implementation of the editor and still keep using this editor in the same file. A lot of the same ideas we have with that apply in this context. And I actually seriously think this is a, uh, a super useful uh, design pattern thing. I don't know what to call it, but I think it, it will actually turn out to be super useful for creating this sort of bi-directional, hybrid, textual, graphical programs. So that gives us our tower, all right? Thank you all. Uh, before I wrap up, though, I have a few last minute notes. Um, I take this idea very seriously, up to and including, I wrote this talk, that you're looking at the source code for the talk right now, in a DSL called Slideshow, used for making slideshows. And in fact, if you were to go to the video website, which is uh, lang.video, uh, well, first of all, you'll notice the video logo itself was made in a uh, image creation DSL. And in fact, the website itself was written in a DSL for writing not just websites, but specifically the video website. So I created a DSL <laughs> for this one website, <coughs> which is great because, you know, I can then go use primitives that make sense only for this website. And it saves a lot of time doing it. <laughs> um, and, I, and I can say this is this this thing is not just me. Uh, several other people have actually used video to edit their own conference videos and have informed me that it saved them a lot of time. So uh, before I wrap up, if you want to learn more about this, I recommend you check out Fear of Macros, which is written by Greg Hendershot. It just sort of goes through all the a lot of the technical details of how you use the racket macro system. And at a more philosophical level, 
I recommend you check out Matthew Butterick's beautiful racket. Uh, it's great at just sort of putting down into words this idea of making DSL DSLs. Also, there's a lot of academic literature that goes into this. Two papers in particular stick out to me. Um, composable and compilable macros and languages as libraries. These were uh, pretty seminal to the uh, idea that went into video. And, um, and thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, now would be the time. And again, video uh, is at lane.video. Uh, and I have been, like, I, I still work on this um, pr pretty much daily. So, thank you. As Leaf has better time management than we do, we actually do have time for questions. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so thanks. Um, I, I, so I get it that it's easy to create a type system for your videos, uh, but also I get it that when you create a type system, you have to prove stuff like progress and preservation. Ah um, yes. How easy is it to do this? To do this? Did you do it? Eh, that's a great question. So I did not because I don't care about doing that, but. I have colleagues in, that work with me that do. So, uh, we have another DSL, which I didn't talk about, called Cur, which is similar to Coq in a lot of ways in that you can use it to do a lot of theorem proving stuff. Um, that one is still also research done by William Bowman, but it, it, it is really cool, and it, to me it seems quite promising. Thank you. Yes. Oh, yeah, sorry, I can't. Yeah, I yeah. can't find it. <laughs> okay. How do you deal with stuff like synchronizing slides to the video? Because many sites from conference websites, they just have like one section for the slides and one for the person talking. Oh, so right. Could you like theoretically use audio cues or something like that? To yeah. Make them align well? Or? It's a good question. So the question was, how do you synchronize, if we were to go back all the way to the beginning, when you have a presenter's screen and the presenter's video, you know, how do you, how do you time them up? Um, so the way professionals do that is they have sort of audio cues that automatically tell software when to link it up. Amateurs aren't that rich, unfortunately. Uh, so I had to do this manually. Uh, it was very frustrating and very time consuming. Um, with video, I was able to sort of play both videos, find the point, and then write down that, that timestamp. But now, because of this sort of hybrid textual um, graphical editor, I was able to use something more akin to what the, the, the professionals do with, if I can come up with an actual timestamp, I can then grow graphically, just line up the two videos, um, and then just push it on through the, the, the make a conference video function, if you will. All right. OK. Uh, one more, Nicole? Um, so I totally uh, believe that you saved a lot of time by automating this video editing, and that you could already leverage um, the work you did with just one ap application of it. Um, but I think, mm, so on the other hand, I see a lot of people and they, you know, just automate something just because they like automating things and they spend way more time <laughs> automating than, you know, they actually get out of it. So, so what is your experience? Do you also see this that is to a balance or do fabulous you just question. <laughs> I love this question so much. <laughs> Thank you for asking it. The, the question, if anyone didn't hear, basically boils down to we're computer scientists, we spend too much time automating crap. <laughs> yes? <laughs> so, um, you aren't alone in that assumption. Uh, all of my colleagues thought I was insane 
and was going to either realize this is a stupid idea and stop, or sort of drive myself out of grad school doing it. And you know what, they were right in that, that that's a fair expectation. I personally found, though, that the, the sort of patterns described for making DSLs here to be so useful, it actually does save a lot more time than it takes, simply because you're, you're writing and using your DSL sort of in parallel, so you're only building enough of the implementation to use for your one program. And then maybe you'll go and, when you want to use it again, you'll go increase it in the same way that, say, a sysadmin will create shell scripts that do just enough for what they need and they create this loop. In fact, that's sort of the motivation for this video for editor-oriented programming idea. Uh, I want to be able to have just a little domain-specific editor that just is really great at this one, you know, maybe I want to use this a great domain specific editor for editing a movie. Did, does that answer your question? Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. Well, we'll do that one more. You have one. Uh, yeah, well, it's a second question. How, uh, how does the version control work in this kind of stuff? You have text and pictures. <laughs> I use Git. Um, some of this is still, again, research. The sort of pre-existing video uh, saves the text files in a sort of hybrid text binary format, which is ugly. Uh, my latest research has been in sort of turning this into a textual uh, only representation so that uh, when you change, go and change the implementation of the editor itself, the use of the editor does not break, but instead goes and reflects the changes in your implementation. Uh, this sort of boils down to uh, embedding, similar to embedding like a, a JSON object in your source code. It ends up looking something like that. Uh, so it's not, you know, if, if you had a painting, right, at some point you're going to have to store either the pixels or the sine waves that represent your painting. Uh, but we do a good job of trying to just push that at the end and, and hoping you don't have conflicts. If you got a better idea, I would love to collaborate with you. Um, unfortunately, it seems like small talk serialization is about the state of the art there. At the moment, I actually am working on a DSL to fix that. <laughs> Thank you, Lee.